Welcome to Talking in Stations. This is Season 2, Episode 6. On the show today, we have myself, Artemis Albosa, a member of Pandemic Horde. Also joining us, as always, Ron USMC. Good evening, guys. He is from Test Alliance, Please Ignore, and we have Silver Suspiria. Hello, New Eden. That was an interesting voice. He is from Federation Uprising. And special guest on today's show, you may know him from his recently launched podcast, The Whole Story, presented by Talking in Stations, Izuki Z. How's everybody doing tonight? I'm doing very well. How about yourself? Doing good. All right. Izuki is a member of Scary Wormhole People. If you're an old-school wormholer, you may know him better from his corporation, the Dark Space Initiative, or TD Sin, as they were often referred to. I'm ashamed to say that until about two months ago, I did not realize those two groups were the same. I remembered hearing tons of stories about this very storied group called TD Sin, who is a very large PvP organization in wormhole space. And then there's also this weird group called Scary Wormhole People, who have fantastic fan art, but are kind of weird. And I didn't realize they're the same. We're storied and weird, thank you. Accurate. So, let, let's, let's hear this story, shall we? But first, I want to hear about your particular story, Exuki. Uh, how long have you been playing this game? When did you start? Um, uh, I started in March of 2000, and so I actually turned 2000 and what? 2009. Oh, wow. Looking it up now, I my character was born in uh, March 16th, so I'm 10 years and over in a month old now. Did you do the standard? Double like, digit. I made three or four trial accounts, tried to decide if I got into the game, and then eventually made your main, or did you, you start out on Exuki Z and then you were hooked from the beginning? Nope. Um, yeah, I, I had one trial account, um, that was uh, several months prior. Um, I, uh, I, you know, I had a group of people I played with. Um, they were like, "Hey, let's give this, let's give Eve a shot," and um, it didn't really stick. Uh, you know, the new player experience. It, it, so, I mean, many people still say the new player experience is bad. If you think it's bad now, I can assure you, it was even worse ten years ago. Like they, like. People still attribute it, you know, do the like, here's some money, here's a ship, fuck you. That's what they say, right? That's literally what it was. Like, there was practically no direction. If you did not have friends, you were not going to stay in the game back then unless you really tried. And I had friends and still didn't tr stay with the game that hard, you know. Um, none of us knew what we were doing, so my group, we, we gave it a shot. Um, and the reason my in-game character has a Z on it, like my gamer tag everywhere else is just Exuki without the Z. So my first character was just Exuki. And then uh, I couldn't remember the password and I didn't care enough to go try to get that character back. So um, I decided to toss a Z on the end and remade my next character. And this time, one of the friends I tried with actually stuck it out. So he now knew what we were doing. So when he showed us the ropes again, we actually didn't die as much to level two high sec missions and um you know actually stuck around a little bit and uh within a month i was dying in wormhole space instead so it worked wow a month in and you're already hopping into wormhole space what uh what drew you into wormhole space why'd you why'd you go to the the weird wacky wonderful other w adjectives area of space called wormhole space? Um. So I would say, so actually a month, is, I'm looking at my Eve, who it was actually more like, it looks like maybe two months. Um, so the story is actually um, kind of funny. So as, uh, as nerds do, I was at my high school prom, um, standing in the corner with other nerds, not dancing. Hang on, hang on, hang on. You got that wrong there, dude. Real nerds don't go to prom. Real nerds sit at home and play video games during prom. Okay. You can't call yourself a nerd and start a story, I was at prom. That's not how this works, but continue. Well, I guess I was a nerd at prom, okay? Um, and I ran into one of my other nerd friends who was at prom, and um, we started catching up about, you know, just games. And it turned out that 
we were friends and neither of us had ever mentioned to the other that we both played Eve and he was already in TD sin. He was a director in TD sin and was like, come hang out with my bunch of bads that are doing wormhole space stuff. So I said, sure, because my corp was just like some weird high sec mission corp that we only kind of thought we knew what we were doing. So then we jumped in. Absolutely. I had no idea what we were doing. And, um, I have been there ever since. Wow. So how is the, the learning curve for wormhole space? I remember when my initial like high sec mining and mission running corp decided to move into wormhole space because our CEO just went crazy one day. Um, we we read through we we literally spent a month and a half reading through and finding all of the blogs and forum posts and video tutorials we could possibly find to learn everything about the mechanics and we still had no freaking clue what we were doing so how is that experience for you um it was mo i'd say it it was um full of explosions but every like it was optimistic um, you know, everybody, you know, we, we lost a bunch of ships, mostly to rats at the time. Like it, it rewind 10 years, wormhole space was empty. Like there were dangerous people there and there was PVP happening, but compared to today, it was empty. Like it was not uncommon that you would jump into a wormhole system and there was nothing, you know, back then, of course, we didn't have citadels or upwell structures, but you wouldn't even see passes, not dead sticks, not online sticks, literally nothing. Um, so we died a lot to rats. We died a lot to people catching us because, you know, I remember it took, it was a long time before a bunch of us understood um, bubble mechanics, like how they, how interdiction would catch you while you're in warp. Um, it was, a, it was a lot of people very much learning through trial and error. And a lot of the kind of progress spurts early on were due to, we'd managed to seduce some older, more experienced member into joining our band of bads and they would impart their wisdom onto us and um i mean <laughs> i remember being <laughs> excuse me ecstatic about getting my first battleship and uh having no idea what actually to do with it besides that i had a bigger ship that's more expensive so you joined wormhole space because you met a real life friend who lived in wormhole space and then you stuck with it uh, your experience then with other space, right, with K space is exclusively high sec. You've never done the null sec thing, never done the low sec thing? Uh, no, not, not as a full time job. I mean, I've had alternate characters that have done, you know, they've been in some null sec groups. They've done the ratting and occasionally even a couple strat ops, but I would never claim to have much experience with them. Um, and I've never really lived in or done anything in, in, in low sec besides like we've gate camped, you know, just because. Where most space takes you everywhere. We've gate camped. We've tackled things in low sec. We've had carriers dropped on us. We've fought in faction warfare plexus while people yell at us because that we're not actually part of the faction war and we're messing up whatever it is that they're doing. <laughs> so you know, I've done all of those, but I've never, you know, directly played or interacted with any of those. Things. Interesting. So let, let's talk. Uh, let's shift our focus a bit to your alliance, Scary Wormhole People, and your corporation, the Dark Space Initiative. So you joined them very shortly after you started playing the game, and that was around ten years ago. How long has TD Sin been a thing? Um, so TD Sin will turn ten next month. Um, TD Sin has existed um, since May of. May 2009. I joined practically, you know, it wasn't even a month old when I joined it. It was a couple weeks old. So it's been around for a very long time. As I'm sure any group that's been along around for years, they can look back and say, we're not anywhere. You know, we're nothing like what we were two years ago, let alone, um, you know, 10. Um, Excuse me. Um, like if, if you were to, you know, set out now and, and go back several years and say one day you got, you know, you're going to be one of the the largest wormhole corps out there, then I would probably not really believe you, especially considering for years we kind of just hung on as like a close knit bunch of people that only slowly but steadily knew what they were doing. And I mean, for years, I, I mean, you know, of the 10, I'd say only the last four would I even say the corp was trying to actively be out there as a a pvp corp really you know the first six was just we were a corp 
we crabbed a lot. Sometimes we'd shoot back when people were ganking us. Um, occasionally we would say we're trying to PvP, but it usually went poorly. It's kind of really accelerated, though. Like, even two years ago, TDSN doesn't uh, doesn't map directly to what we have now. The, the level of organization, people, sometimes that we know what we're doing is very different than what it was that long ago. So what's, uh, what's causing that acceleration? Why the change? A lot of it's probably has, has kind of snowballed. Um, you know, it's a... A lot of it is drive. We have we've had a lot of people join that wanted to go do more. And you know, at some point, about you know, around two years ago, we specifically made the very conscious decision to push hard and be a PvP corp where people rat somewhere else on their own. Um, like um, you know, we don't PVE on mains generally. We're not uh, we're not ratting in our chain. A lot of different things that uh, in wormhole space is generally one of the kind of big separators between a lot of your your most dangerous large corps and your smaller ones is at some point they make the conscious decision to only worry about hunting and tell everyone else to go make their money somewhere else is a pretty common and there's there's plenty of corps that are that don't do that still but um you know it's it's a common theme around your your biggest pvp ones and we made the decision to try to jump up it's interesting that you mentioned that because it, it's very reminiscent of the cultural shifts we've seen in low sec and null sec alliances. Thinking back to it used to be uh, everyone was both a PvPer and a PvEer, right? Because you have to make your risk, you got to pay for your ships. And then the hardcore focus like PL back in the day where it's, it was you PvP, you do not PvE on your main. Sorting your isk is your own problem on your alts. But your character is in this alliance. Their purpose is here to be PvPers, not PvE. And then more recently, especially kickstarted with Roracles and super carrier mining or ratting and things like that, we've seen the culture shift back to where everybody is both a PvPer and a PvEer. And the biggest hurdle is getting a culture around everybody, even if you aren't interested in PvEing right now, you're in standing fleet ready to protect those who are. And so that's how you get your PvP. It's interesting that sort of Wormholes is a step behind, if you will, in that cycle of going from PvE plus PvP to strictly PvP in the culture sort of thing. Well, I think, and I would also say, you know, we can't be like that, really. You know, the, the disjointed nature of Wormhole space makes it so. Right now, I guarantee you, there are people in TD Sin that are out, you know, making money on in some wormhole somewhere, but it's not connected to our main wormhole. Um, and so, in fact, if they're doing it properly right now, it's not connected to anything. They've completely isolated the system before they start ratting. Um, and so, you know, that nature, if they get tackled, they're dead. Like, I can have everyone online in a standing fleet, but that doesn't do us any good because if any of our ratters actually get caught, most likely, if they're, you know, they're ratting in battleships, if they actually get caught, they're going to be dead long before we could even get a fleet there, even if for some reason we were connected by, a, you know, a couple jumps. And if they're ratting in capitals, they might live long enough for us to have potentially gotten there. You know, there's a lot, we, they don't have a way in, we might not have a way out. So getting there would be difficult. So that's not really something Wormhole Space is ever going to really see. You know, you, you can have people ratting in their home system with people on standby. You see that occasion, occasionally, but um, it's uncommon. Wormhole Space ANOMs don't respawn. So, like, if I run all my ANOMs, like, it could be a week before I have enough ANOMs back to actually be worth undocking to go run again. Um, so it's uh, it's kind of like apples to oranges in that sense. I'd say you're, you're, you're like we're we're kind of we're a step back, yeah, but we're also never going to really evolve into that. How does moon mining play into that? I know, like I briefly experimented with. I found a C three wormhole that had something like sixty, no, it was more like forty moons in it, and so I was setting up Athnoras and planned on getting a bunch of oracles in the C three, which C three wormholes the connections are small enough that people can't get capitals in. You have to build them on the inside. And so if anybody wanted to kill my Roracles, they'd be limited in the size of fleet they could bring in based on the mass of the connection to the wormhole. And it was a null sex static, which meant that it'd be very difficult for someone who, for instance, put a scanner alt inside to find a route for their fleet to come and attack me. And so I thought it'd be great. 
Is that something you you suspect could change things, or is wormhole moon mining not profitable enough, not consistent enough? What's the... It's primarily not profitable enough. Um, you know, my my two cents on that matter is really just that uh, I think CCP dropped the ball by not giving us better quality moon. Um, in that wormhole space mining, I'd say is quite possibly some of the da most dangerous parts of mining as far as you know, actual safety goes because mo most NullSec is actually some of the safest places to be mining. You know, um, Vorkwell is dying null every day for sure, but um, most of, you know, if the group is organized and like you said, they're ready to light a sign and I have a fleet on standby to come save my Vorkwell, um, mining fleets can be pretty safe with the power of the panic module that can, you know, save the subcaps. They, they die absolutely, but... Um, Wormhole space is dangerous enough that most people don't bother mining in it because the moons aren't worth enough. Like there are people out there, they have Athenors, they mine, but it's not very common. And I would have loved to see it. Like when when CCP announced, you know, I I want to say it was at Vegas a couple of years ago. They said, hey, we're dropping out. Uh, we're gonna, you know, we're releasing moon mining for wormhole space. I got excited. And in fact, you know, day one, when it hit, you know, we had people going and doing the survey thing that like half of us were like, oh, shit, how do you even do this? Because no one in wormhole space had ever surveyed moons before. Um, and we got excited and then quickly realized that like it's it's not worth that much. It, it's not worth more than I can make running anomalies. So um, like people do it, especially like the p only people in TDSIN that I know of that really mine or work while mine is because they do it on an alt in our home system while we're actively doing something somewhere else where, A, they're fairly confident that we could save their, save it. Um, and B, you know, it's because they're already doing something else because work while mining is neither the most exciting thing to ever happen in EVE. Um, and in wormhole space, it's even not profitable compared to nulls. So. Anyone that would want to be mining would actually probably just put that mining tune in a NullSec alliance that will accept mining alts and then just mine there and make better money and probably be safer. So about the safety with Oracle mining, are you saying that it's safer in most NullSec because people are doing it typically under super umbrellas? Because I would argue that the ability to not be able to light a sino and drop a fleet on your face makes wormholes more safe because what typically happens with whaling fleets is you send out a bunch of scouts all over the place and they find a target and they can get to you quickly by you know sinoing mids across right in a wormhole i would think the whole fleet would have to happen upon you um and then still they're limited they can't bridge uh dictors on top of you or or anything that that typically happens you know because typically if i'm defending a rourke fleet and i'm a small group I'm going to sino jam the system just so they can't drop dictors or they can't drop dreads on my face. Right. So I think wormhole has that same sort of protection where the fleet's going to happen upon me. It's most likely going to be a subcap fleet. I might be able to fight that off as opposed to the typical null sec whaling fleet where you probably don't have a shot, even if you do panic. I think part of the insecurity comes from a lack of local, like thinking back Part of the reason I asked the question sure. to begin with was an article by on the New Eden Report about the fall of a wormhole. Apparently it was called Aphelion, but it was a C1 wormhole where a group called Worm Life set up a bunch of Athenors and they were oracle mining all day, every day. It was a C1, so it had very small, you couldn't even fit most battleships into it. I think the Nestor and maybe the Lashak can fit in, but apart from that, not much else. And um, But they set up all the stuff. They were an industrial organization and miners. And they got evicted, so to speak. Their structures were basically farmed for the loot and the kill mails. And they realized beforehand that they were going to be evicted because they had been getting their work rules dropped by the same group who had put a spy into their corporation. And then because there's no local, all this spy had to do was be online, scan the chain, or know the chain through their wormhole mapping tools and then know when the Rorquals were out mining. And it didn't even have to be a spy in this particular case. You could just literally see the scanner alt in this wormhole, scan the chain when you know Rorquals are out mining, and that's how you get your PvP fleet in, and the people who are Rorquals mining have no clue. Mm. Yes, but that's how supers die in NullSec too. Right? Null supers die in NullSec from the same thing. It's a, you're, either, you're blue scouted, 
or your blue tackled. I think in in Warhol, couldn't you just camp the exits of your entrances or at least the areas surrounding your entrances and like see them coming at least? Like and looks like if a whaling fleet's gonna get you, you don't you could see them six systems out and not have enough time to get away because a hyperspatial dictor is on his way with a sino, right? I don't know. Hmm. In in most cases, if if you're if you're getting killed in a work wall in wormhole space, um, unless you're bad, which is very possible, you're most likely mining with your system completely sealed off, so there is no way in or out of your system. So the only way someone comes and gets you is they roll in, like they spawn a wormhole in, in which you had no way of knowing that they were coming until that new sig pops up on your probe window, and if they're a competent group, they've got a saber on you very quickly. Um, I would generally say that in most in most wormhole corpse situations, their work walls are probably are not very safe. In simply because if their work hole gets tackled, it's probably going to die because most corporations in wormhole space aren't of any you know the same size that a lot of case space groups are. So if a fifteen man like fifteen people is not large by any means for most of Eve, but in wormhole space, fifteen it's fifteen people itself is already like you're larger than average fleet. And if a Vorqual gets tackled by 15 and with, you know, now, especially with the power of uh, triglav ships, you know, Vorqual's die pretty quick to Lashax or, or Drekovic. So, you know, um, I think it, it, you're, you're completely right. Um, you know, I've never signed a fleet onto a work wall. The works I've killed in case space because we burned there because we don't have Titans to ferry our, our, our whaling fleets around. Um, so in that sense, it can be more dangerous. Absolutely. Um, but I think that it's also in more like in wormhole space, work walls that are tackled are probably more likely to also die in wormholes because they're on the less likely to actually have the backup that case space groups might have. Yeah. So less likely that's exactly to be tackled. where I wanted to get to. Right, the 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 nature of um, what is a threat is much different in wormhole space, right? The inner hell does crazy work with a small amount of Drukovix, right? Let's talk about that. They're, what they're is... not very small anymore, though. I, I, yeah, true, but they have been known to do that, right? Like a, a group of twenty Drex could kill supers and oracles pretty quickly. Let, let's put aside the topic of groups diving out into K space for their PvP and talk about what does PvP look like in wormhole space nowadays? The answer is probably very, it's, it, the answer is it varies substantially. Um, a little bit of what time of day it is combined with which part of wormhole space. Um, I will fight to the end in insisting that people that are talking about wormhole space being dead are they're uh, they're looking at it with blinders on and just ignoring the stuff that is going on as not being what they're interested in um you know it's like uh it's it's a different landscape than it is but you know that's probably true of all of eve you know eve is constantly uh, changing um low class wormhole space which uh low class generally refers to classes one two three and four that's the part of wormhole space that capitals cannot traverse um is mostly small gang PvP. Small gang I, in in this context is I'm refer generally talking about single digits to maybe the low teens. Um, those kind of ganks and fights are happening constantly in, in low class space. Um, in fact, uh, despite people talking about how Eve is declining um, and think you know wormhole space is dying and all of that. Um, the amount of think things dying in wormhole space is actually continuing to slowly creep up, as has, for the most part, the ISK value uh, dying in wormhole space. Um, like across 2018, you saw generally a positive direction with a little bit of that, you know, kind of dip that Eve itself generally sees in uh, in the summer. You have several large groups that when they fight um you know it's a kind of clash of the t clash of the titans or you know uh, there's uh, there's the big big corpse fighting a lot of people see that happening less frequently and deduce that wormhole space is dying but i would say that uh, my description or interpretation at least of what i see happening is simply there are fewer large corpse sitting at the top than there were several years ago there's a lot more small corpse um 
I would say I, I say that probably is a positive because I think it's pretty healthy to have lots of small independent corps, all fighting, all doing their stuff. Um, you know, they're out there um, and they're all doing their own thing and beating each other up when they run into each other. And then you've got your large groups that sometimes gank those. You know, you, you don't see fights between the really big groups and the small groups that often, mainly because. A lot of these corporations panic when they see 10 people and ships rolling through their wormhole. So um, that's Brianna, my wife. Uh, Hi, so, Mrs. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's kind of what's going on, right? There, there's a little bit of everything happening. You've got corporations living in wormholes that live in wormholes purely to whale. Inner Hell, I mean, Inner Hell does more than just whaling, but you mentioned them. They're, they're you know, they do a lot of whaling. Hard Ox has moved into a system that has a static null sec for whaling. Dead terrorists, uh, Cronus Ritual, like, you know, the list goes on and on. There's a lot of corps. They live in wormholes, but just to prey on null sec. You've Wait got corporations. Dead terrorists is a wormhole group now? Yep, dead terrorists. I've been live, for a while, right? They, At least. They, yeah, they live in a C3 static null sec, and they go, they run, what? I think it's two, they run two pre-scheduled whaling fleets a week, uh, if I remember correctly, off of their last recruiting post they posted on RE jobs. Yeah, they've been there for, I would say, at least a year or something like that. They've been doing that. We ran into them um, in low sec not too long ago, popped out of a wormhole, tried to gank something. So Silver, what is what is their a TLDR of dead terrorist history? Because they weren't always a wormhole group. No, I mean I, they they're kind of the group that uh, bounces around wherever they can find the content. I think, you know, they'll they'll be anywhere that they they can find the fight. They, I think they've done just about everything: uh, low sec, null sec, not wormhole. I was gonna say I remember them specifically when they were a low sec powerhouse, much akin to. I wouldn't say they they were the top dogs at any time, but sort of like what Shadow Cartel is now, where Snuff are the top dogs, and then there's sort of everybody else who you can rank them as far as how many dudes they can put in fleet, how competent are they in a particular fleet. And it, I'd say in their heyday, when I was familiar with them, they're at the level that Shadow Cartel is now. I would agree. Anyway, sorry, I cut you off. That surprised me that they were still alive, and then that they were also in wormhole space. What were you? What were you saying? Well, I, uh, yeah, it's, I like that though. That there are groups that that live in in wormhole space to prey on on null seekers because you know it's like every day opening a box of candy. Like, who can I mess with today? Right? I just rage roll a hole and like, oh, look who I found. Yeah, you know, I think that's very interesting. Yeah. Um... You've got a lot of then you've got plenty of like small corporations that are living in mostly low class and you know they're just corporations that are doing whatever they find like and I you know Tedison was one of those at one point you know people would say what do you guys do and we'd say whatever we find we find sites we run sites we find ore we mine ore we find gas we huff that too especially back when gas was worth tons of is we find people we shoot them and maybe they blow up or we do you know like we just do whatever's there. Um, they have no particular focus besides saying, like, we're enjoying what wormhole space is. There's no local, you know, what's out there changes every day. And, you know, most wormhole corporations that are active, they roll their holes fairly frequently. So you're rolling the dice constantly, and sometimes you find goodies and sometimes you don't. Um, and then, you know, we can keep kind of moving up. You've got larger corps that are, you know, working their way. I think th uh, there's a couple I suspect that say that they're, they want to be up at the top. Um, like I had a, I had a group called the mighty beans on my podcast on Monday. Um, and they're a fairly new corp that's already, I'd say punching pretty well above their weight. Um, and they're on track to, uh, you know, maybe give us a year and I'll be coming back and listing them as one of the, one of the big dogs that's what, right up there. If that's, if that's what they want to do, or maybe they'll hit a point and say, we're happy right here. And that's great too. Um, there's corporations that pretty much exist mostly for just 
burning other people's homes down um, and wormhole space evicting people from their home is an extremely profitable enterprise because wormhole space does not have asset safety so if you can imagine how much stuff can be in a structure in k space when you blow it up in wormhole space it all falls out and you get all of it so there are corporations many of which are russian right now that are notorious for they're just praying i mean they're mostly preying on the weak right but that that's the nature of Eve is they're finding corporations and they're shooting all their structures and they're seeing what falls out. Sometimes, you know, they rally and a big fight happens. Um, other times uh, they just self-destruct and, you know, log off or, you know, they put up a fight and die. It all, you know, all, all of the above and that's going on. You've got corporations. I mean, like that. That's I, I. I laughed because when they first announced moon mining, it was a meme in wormhole space. They said some people are going to set up massive workwell farms in C ones because of C one wormholes don't even let battleships through. That's how tiny they are. Um, so that system was in theory safe, you know, or safe ish. Um, uh, and then, you know, there's just like you said, there's systems that have like, there's systems that in wormhole space that have over 100 moons. I'm sure that's true in K space too. Um, but the weight of wormhole space is a lot more evenly distributed. Like, there aren't just, there aren't these like R64s that are worth a metric ton, and then these moons down here that are worth nothing. Wormhole space moons have a much tighter correlation. There are still good moons and bad moons, but if you give me a hundred moons, I guarantee you there's several gems in there, along with probably a bunch of decent quality. So there are there are corporations that judging from the fact that they have an Athenor on every single moon in their system, I assume must be doing lots of mining um, that are out here. I mean one of the things you probably probably won't find is industry. Like I can't imagine there's many people that would move to a wormhole just to build stuff there simply because that's a lot of unnecessary hassle and logistics for building. But I mean, wormhole space has a little bit of everything going on in it. You know, there's giant corpse fighting, there's little corpse fighting, there's people burning each other's, kicking each other's sandcastles over. Cause that's, you know, any of favorite metaphor. Um, existing running sites like there, there's everything going on still in wormhole space can i want to talk about the loop pinata mechanic for a second sure because that's very interesting i i, I have first a statement i think that low low sec and null sec could use a dose of this maybe not the loop pinata but somewhere in the in between because i think what the rest of space suffers from is not enough reward for the risk and commitment of killing a structure like to attack even a fortizar or you know a keep star even requires such great effort for not really great reward. I mean anybody can spam down you know citadels now. So in wormholes you get this um, reward mechanic that drives the conflict. Yeah, sometimes it means that uh, smaller corps get picked on, but it, it's a big driver. And I I think we need to like look at how to balance that out in in other areas of space. And then my follow up question to that is. How do you as a corporation mitigate that risk of loot pinata? Like, do you spread uh, um, your assets around a little bit? Do you try and not keep all things in one uh, one basket? Like, how do you work that? Before you answer that question, Kazuki, I think uh, another important bit of context is that the timers are different when you're reinforcing structures in K-space and in wormhole space. So in wormhole space, it can take as short as two to three days to fully kill a structure if you're paying attention to when the timers are set. Whereas in K-Space, it's taking a minimum of 5 for null sec, if I recall correctly. So it, it is not only do you have the carrot of stuff will drop when I kill this thing, but it also takes a lot less time to kill it. Anyway, back to the question. How do you mitigate that? Uh well, I wanted to comment first on, you know, if anyone actually cared for a wormholer's perspective on whether or not non-wormhole space would benefit from changes to asset safety you specifically talked about how there isn't enough reward i would also kind of say the other side of that coin is i think very true there's also very little incentive for people to go out of their way to defend their structures um yeah, i mean I, I spam it back up right <laughs> Like, you know, um, it's like the only purpose they they serve is this is a place to dock and I a place that I can tether. And when I lose it, it doesn't matter. But um, I believe at least that 
I think it would help if there was people would have a little more interest in making sure that they're not losing their stuff, you know, because in wormhole space, what something we can generally see is at least when corpse are losing their home, there is some sort of last stand because this is it. But when they're, when, you know, when our, when their main structure blows up, they lose everything. So you see people, you know, they, you see people handing out every ship they can get. You see people blinging everything to their heart's content to get out there. And they say, you know, we're probably going to die, but they go down in a blaze of fire fighting. And, um, you know, I, I don't want to tell, you know, um, I am not as well versed in a lot of K Space's history, but I know for I know several times people have just shrugged and let their home burn because they get all their stuff back, or the fight's unfightable, or you know morale was lost a long time ago, so they stop bothering. And wars can frequently be over before they've seemingly even gotten that far in in, in some time. Um, so how do you mitigate it? Um, <clears throat> there's a couple different ways that people do this. Um, some people literally live with if my home burns i don't care because i have very little in it which is a common tactic that you see a lot of the russian corporations using um inner hell has lost their home several times over the past couple years and i think some of the reasons that they play and do things the way they do is because they don't fear retaliation as much because when their home burns it's not a huge blow to them and i say this and someone might point out I mean, hello, when their home burned back in October, over 700 billion died. Yes, over 700 billion died, but they still did not care substantially because, I mean, uh, you know, they, they, they just rebuilt. Now, I imagine their new homes have even less stuff than that one did. But, uh, I mean, I've burned down several Russian holes before and very little drops. Uh, either because bad luck maybe, or maybe they had actually packed it all up before it blew up. But uh, I also know that that's a tactic that they do. And I know other corps that do um, spreading your timers out works, you know, having a lot of structures all at different timers. I'm sure this, you know, this is not a unique uh, feature to wormhole space, but you know, make it. So if you're going to come in and burn down all my stuff, you're going to have to stay for a longer period of time. Um, and then, you know, uh, you know, all your eggs in one basket, spread your loot out between the stuff that doesn't help you in the long run. Usually most corporations, when their stuff gets burned, all of it gets burned. Um, you know, it can depend on what, you know, who's hitting you and for what reason, but otherwise a lot of people come in and they're there to burn your home down. They're there to do all of it. They don't care if, if they, they want, you know, sometimes you'll, you'll be attacking someone, you'll watch them moving all their crap from their quarters out of that Astro house. It's like, all right, buddy, you saved your stuff for like two days, but we're burning that one too. We're just burning it later. Um, and then, yeah, as Art, uh, Artemis noted, um, on um, timer wise, wormhole space has the shortest timers. In fact, if I find a low power structure, it can be dead within 12 hours. Um, you know, optimal finding, but I can reinforce it and kill its hull if if the, if I found it at the right time of the week. You know, um, the distance between first uh, for a low power initial reinforcement and blowing it up can be as short as half a day. Um, otherwise, the timers are all a minimum of full power. You know, if I attack it, <laughs> right, I can do shield 24 hours later, armor 24 hours hull. So you can be in and out of a hull and burn. If all their timers are the same, I can burn the whole thing in three days. Usually they're not quite the same. Um, but, you know, I can hit their big stuff in, in a three-day window in and out pretty quick. I love your comment about the last stand. It's not something we really see in known space. And I remember um, Keskora a few months ago talking about uh, her last stand, and it was it was awesome. Um, we need more of that in EVE. I actually want to go back to that point a bit and maybe discuss the attributes of a group who will continue after they've been evicted versus those who will sort of disband or fall apart when they have been evicted. And I actually want to pivot to Ron here because Ron has been a member of Test Alliance Please Ignore for years. And during that time, I think you've been evicted five separate times from K-Space. And so I sort of want to compare and contrast what it's like to be a group that is evicted in K-Space versus what it's like to be a group that's evicted in Wormhole Space. And then is there a similarity between the groups that survive and the groups that don't? 
I think the groups that survive an eviction are <clears throat> together for reasons more than just making ISK, right? They're, you know, a group, they want to stay together, they're, you know, friends and family, etc. And, you know, yeah, I don't, I don't know how many times we've been evicted. I, I think we've been evicted 10, 10 or 11 times, I forget. But, you know, if you build that sort of core group and, you know, you're so used to playing with them that getting evicted is just, you know, moving to a different system. It's not a big deal. Um, but we have last stands, you know, some of the biggest fights in EVE, you know, uh, are generally like last stands. And, you know, uh, with wormhole space, it's so strange to me because it's, it's like on a smaller scale and it's, you know, wormhole space can never be truly defended, right? Because there's always going to be some you know, jackrabbit corporation that's going to be able to get 300 people in and then that's that, it's over, right? So, you know, in NullSec, it, it's much more, you know, fluid that way because you can call in extra people and you can, you know, move around and do things like that. And in, you know, wormhole space, it, it always, whenever I hear people talk about it, it's always it sounds like you're kind of hiding up in a house and like all the doors are blocked and you just keep shutting the door and people keep trying to come in and you just keep shutting the door, but you're still in the same house. You're not going anywhere and people are going to kick you out of that house, but you just keep shutting the door. So I don't know. Interesting. All right. Well, uh, before we transition into the news, I do want to mention Izuki. You recently recorded, or you recently restarted, if you will, of old podcasts you used to do. What was the name of that podcast for anybody who wants to go and listen to it? The old one, not the new one. Uh, so last year I ran a podcast that was called A Game of Holes. Um, and if you search for that on YouTube, you can find the channel and it's got a whole bunch of videos. Um, and so that shot for, you know... Uh, a total of, I think, 13 episodes um, before combination of um, things running out of time for this or that and real life getting busy led me to keep selling. I, 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 f- I fell into that, like, guys, I promise I'm going to shoot another episode. I just need to finish getting this done, I think, next week. And then, like, next thing you know, like, half a year has gone by and I haven't done one. Um, and so I started putting the plans together over the winter to say I wanted to pull something back together. And then... Um, you know, I uh, even towards the end of last year, Matterall had, had reached out and asked me if uh, I'd be interested in doing something with talking in stations. And so um, my life settled back around a bit and I said, I'm going to give it another shot. So every other Monday, I am live on Monday at 0100 or Tuesday 0100, Monday night for the United States. Um, you know, doing a uh, doing a po- another podcast show um, purely focused on wormhole space stuff. So if that interests people, great. If it doesn't, then that's fine too. Don't you don't have to come listen to me ramble then. Coming in here with the soft sell. I haven't listened to the most recent episode. I listened to the first one; it was fantastic. But I haven't listened to the one that was recorded this Monday yet because I've been at work. So you've done the soft sell. Now give me the hard sell. What's your TLDR? Hype me up for this episode you just recorded. So for episode two, I kind of every episode has like a quasi theme. I I come in with an idea of what I want to try to focus on. Then I build up the guests around that and then we go with a loose plan. Episode two, I bring in a couple different corporations that are a combination of brand new to wormhole space not new to wormhole space, but they've recently rebranded and started a new corp. And then a, uh, you know, I used to do a whole bunch of case based stuff. And then I said, guys, let's go do wormhole shit and just pack their whole corp up and move. So I had three people that all three of which since as is, I think a lot of people from outside of wormhole space don't know famous wormhole corps so you're probably definitely not going to recognize any of these and i would say that's going to be a recurring theme on my podcast is you're not going to really know who a lot of these people are and that's partially by design but i bring in people that you haven't met and you haven't heard from and they come tell you their stories 
what are we doing in wormhole space? <laughs> why do we do what we're, you know, why are we living where we're living? Why are we loving wormhole space? Um, and I have them try to, you know, just sell a, like, guys, we moved to wormhole space and we're having a blast. So if you're feeling like you need something new to do in EVE, I would say uh, give that a shot. Awesome. And what was the time for that show again? Uh, it's 0100 EVE time Tuesday or Monday night uh, US. Every wow. other Monday. Slash Tuesday. Well, we're gonna... <laughs> Originally, the first episode was was going to be right at midnight, so we put it at twenty three fifty nine, just so we could definitively say which day it's on. Because apparently, no one agrees on whether or not you know O hundred is one day or the other. So we just moved it up a minute, and then uh, we we bumped it an hour though, because some people were uh, the West Coast was complaining it was too early. Europeans are going to complain it's too late no matter what I do, because it can't be until I get home from work. So that's what they. I was gonna say yeah, O one hundred is two a.m. in the UK due to daylight savings time. We've dealt with trying to arrange guests for this show, which has had some difficulties due to that, but. We'll sort it out. It'll be fine. Definitely go and check that show out. It's on the YouTube channel. I think it's... I can't remember if it's published to the TIS podcast feed or if it is on a separate RSS feed, but it's on our website nonetheless, talkinginstations.com. And while I'm in the process of shilling, it occurs to me that I failed to uh, recognize our sponsor. Well, they're soon to be our sponsor. They're not technically our sponsor yet. We're still working out some things, getting all their assets together as far as like what we're supposed to say, and all that jazz. But uh, I should have said at the beginning of the show that this show is sponsored by Eve Mogul. And Eve Mogul is an organization whose mission is to supply New Eden Capsuleers with services to increase their wallets. They offer both in-game and out-of-game services, such as rigged SOTOs, high-sec moon mining, trade hub markets and industry tools, loyalty point store and a supportive and active community you can visit eve-mogul.com if you'd like to check them out and you can go there to learn more and also don't forget to join their discord so that is eve mogul generously sponsoring talking and stations podcasts of various forms if you are interested in having your own organization sponsor or run a video ad on Talking in Stations, you can check out our Discord. There's information in the general channel. All right, well, let's, let's hop into news. And, Izuki, I recognize that most of this has absolutely nothing to do with your gameplay. So if you want to bail on out on us and, like, go gank some oracles or something, by all means. But other than that, I'm welcome to have you give your two cents. And I guess first up on the block, let's let's get it out of the way, actually. We're not going in order on the show notes. Let's talk about the Brisk ban, because it's a thing that happened, and now it's unhappened. So for anybody living under a rock, I hope it's comfortable in there, nice and warm, or rather cool, given that summer is coming up. But CCP announced they gave the final statement on the Brisk Rubal follow-up investigation, and he is unbanned. They made a mistake. We're not going to go too much in depth on this, but does anybody have any quick hot takes on the situation? I think there's a lesson here, right? I think people need to be sensitive to the fact that EVE in general and the function of the CSM leaves people more exposed to their personal life than most games. So when you're doing things to punish people in game and sort of publicly like they did can't be handled like that. And that's really all I'm going to say about that. Um, I'm glad that CCP went back and checked and made sure that they were right. Um, I give them a lot of credit for doing that. They could have just stuck to their guns and said, yep, yep, too bad. Um, but they didn't and they're trying to make it right. But we need to learn from this guys. So you can't fuel the fire with, vague comments about cheating without any other thing to say about it. You just got to be more careful, I think. I think CCP was in the right the whole time. I think they were in the right because if they felt that it was serious enough that it was going to alter gameplay, I think you should ban first and investigate later. 
to be honest. I, I agree with you. To get the you. isk out of the way. Yeah. I, I agree with you. I don't have a problem with them acting quickly. What I, what I think the misstep was how they let the information out. I think if in the future, honestly, if you're going to ban somebody for that, you're totally within your rights to do that. And even if you're unsure, you should still do it, right? To your point, there might be damage going on. And even if you're not sure, we got to stop it first and then investigate. Where I think they misstepped was leaking, the, or not leaking, but stating there was cheating going on or something when they weren't sure yet. I think all they had to say was, Brisk was removed for NDA. They can say that. And then his account was banned, period. And then do their subsequent investigation and then make another statement to say, you know, we banned him because we thought something was going on. Upon further investigation, there was nothing. He's unbanned. And then there would have been no drama I, flame, right? I agree. I agree with that. I mean, because they could have shadow banned, right? They could have yeah, just shadow they, banned. They don't do it to anybody even, else. Yeah, exactly. Right? It, like, if I get banned tomorrow, they're not going to be like, yeah. If I get banned tomorrow, they're not going to be like, Silver Superior was banned today for RMT. Like, they don't do that to anyone else. And, and I think they don't because they know that that causes flames, right? Like, just because the guy was on the CSM didn't mean you needed to specifically say why you banned them. I think that's well, where the, the mistake was made. They will have to announce, like, they wouldn't announce for any random Joe that they got banned. They have to announce that a CSM member got banned because that CSM member is now no longer useful to members of the community who want to give feedback to CCP, right? They can no longer do their job as a CSM member because he was also removed from the CSM. So that is a reason uh, they I'm have not to sure say that's something. That's completely true, though, because the last person that I know got banned from the CSM, as far as I know, there was no public statement ever. Uh, like Are you referring when to Newman, Newman? When when, when Noob Man got banned from the CSM for breach of the NDA and was perma banned, there was none of this for it. There was, you know, there was no big announcement. He was just quietly removed. You know, uh, he told some people, some of the people that also got banned along with him, some of them were a little more public about it because Newman wasn't even really playing at that point. I mean, and maybe that's the difference, but I, th I think. The, you know, I, I don't think the process was wrong here as much as I think the way that they publicly handled it was was all. I mistakes, agree. Right? Like, Absolutely. And I, I think that's what we're all saying, right? Like, yeah. if they if they think I'm cheating, you know, I I have been banned before because CCP thought I was cheating. They ban you, then they investigate you, and then if you know, obviously I'm still here. So uh, the, the times it's happened, it was overturned, but. Like that's how they've handled that. That's how they handle random Joes. That it makes sense to me that that's how they would handle the CSM. I'm not saying that I need you know that they need to announce every time they ban someone, but they also, you know, should probably be pretty confident that they're right before they're going to stand up and you know soapbox and be like, by the way, guys. I mean, because the 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 intention behind it was obvious too. They clearly were trying to earn back transparency points and it backfired horrendously because they ended up being wrong like if you're going to get up in front of the world and give a press release about how so this person's bad and we're putting them in jail you probably want to be positive you're right which it also sounded to me like they were very certain they were right in the first one and then you know, and I know you said you didn't want to dig into it too, too much, but it sounds like everyone on the panel is probably nodding their head the same thing. Like it, the, the, the PR was just really poor because um, <clears throat> they could have banned him, been like, yes, Brisk has been banned pending an investigation or, you know, he has been banned and we'll give an update if there is one and then give it an update later. And most people probably would have been OK with that. Uh, yeah, but, final you know, point they got up, we... they grandstanded and then, you know. Before we move on to another well topic, intended. it would be it would be unfortunate if we didn't address the elephant in the room, which is the very turbulent relationship between Brisk Rubal and the wormhole community. So Izuki, can you give us like a general quick short summary? How has the, the wormhole community responded to this entire situation? Yeah, and I'm looking at you, wormhole people, because he was standing up for your rights. <laughs> you ungrateful little bastards. <laughs> oh, snap. Um, so I will do a bit of generalizing here because, you know, to, to try to sum up how wormhole space feels about anything is probably always, uh, you know, going to be difficult. Uh, Brisk was not largely liked 
from wormhole space for a couple of reasons. Um, <coughs> you know, he, <coughs> excuse me, he did come out. He said, I'm going to help stand up for wormhole space. And, um, I think he tried, um, a lot of people in wormhole space don't feel that he either tried enough or that he maybe some say he didn't really try at all. You know, it's hard to say because a lot of what goes on behind the, the closed doors of the CSM is, is never released. So what a lot of wormhole space sees is first going, don't worry guys, I stood up for you and I tried. And then, you know, we, you might recall the unwilling collateral discussions and, and a lot you know a lot of that stuff where wormhole space was clearly being ignored and a lot of people found it difficult to believe brisk that he was actually even trying um <clears throat> whether or not he was isn't something i'm i think is really worth trying to debate because we can't know a lot of people don't think he did so he was largely not liked um and that may be a vocal minority here you know i'm um, you know there's a discord server full of a lot of uh, of of even wormhole players and largely that server was not a, not brisk fans um second you know brisk was perhaps reasonably so brisk was very smug about the burning of rage um which you know is you know uh whether or not wormhole space liked hard knocks up until rage also very depending on who you ask but for the most part, all of Wormhole Space can unite together against the Gur Null Bears evicting Wormholers, you know, crusades. So um, Brisk was very smug about it. Um, and, you know, so a lot of people were like, but you're the Wormhole CSM and you just evicted a Wormhole Corp, which, you know, not that that's, at, you know, it's Eve. That's that's what we do. You know, we shoot each other and sometimes that means burning down that person's home system. But, you know, it was um, just so a lot of people didn't like initiative and brisk and brisk you know uh, especially during rage brisk was very active on the wormhole communities discord server frequently be being very smug you know he definitely enjoyed stirring the pot um and so wormhole uh, the last couple of weeks has kind of been like an emotional roller coaster for a lot of wormhole space you know there was rejoicing on praise bob when the announcement came out that he had been banned um and then there was the announcement that there's an investigation and the people were like, what? And then today, you know, um, I didn't see a ton of chatter about it. Um, I think, but I, I, I'm sure there's some people that were disappointed <laughs> that he's back. A lot of people are just like amazed at the handling of the whole thing. Um, there's at least one person that had been planning to run for CSM for wormhole space and is now, retracted that decision watching the handling of this because they said i can't afford to go through all this if that happened to me so they're out um <clears throat> that could change you know maybe that was just a you know this is how they feel today but um you know there uh people have made decisions and the, the view of the csm has gotten even poorer from wormhole spaces perspective unfortunately and it is worth noting that after it was announced that he was reinstated unbanned, etc., he resigned from the CSM, he being Brisk. So Brisk is no longer a member of the CSM, even though he is not kicked from it, he resigned after he was reinstated. So I think we're going we're gonna to end this discussion there, because this is a black hole of CCP bashing and drama that I really just... There are other places for that discussion. Go watch Open Comms. That's tomorrow night. Well, I think life. this is also a great opportunity for Izuki to announce his running for CSM. So go ahead, take it away. Izuki. Are you running for CSM, Izuki? I was planning on it, yeah. Uh, hey. Wow. Dude, I totally guessed. I totally guessed. You would be great. I was like, wait, why did Ron awesome. get inside information? What? I know. Uh, <laughs> dude, I just make shit up. I just guessed. <laughs> Ron, the well, secret Tess, wormhole. Tess told me I had to, so here I am, right? Well, I, I ran. I mean, I ran last year. I mean, oh, some people, some people, including other wormholers, seem to have forgotten that I ran last year, and I got very close. Um, I think you know, um, I came in eleventh out of ten in one of the rallies, and then in another, I got bunted to twelfth out of ten. Like I was the second runner up to get a CSM seat, um, so I was. Uh, you know, I was planning on running it again. I've been waiting until this campaign season actually started. Because, like, there's already people out there being like, I'm running, vote for me. And I can tell you, like, 
I I don't want to I don't the campaign season for campaign for CSM can already be a little draining and frustrating. I don't need that to drag for extra time. So when CCP says, "Hey guys, CSM season starting," I would throw out. I will throw up. Be like, "Hey guys, I'm voting," and we'll go from there. So I haven't been hyper vocal about it just yet, but um, you know, as soon as Falcon puts out the the dev blog, which was supposed to be this week, according to last week, um, I guess he still has a day. You know, uh, that was the plan. Well, I think. They're a little busy. All right. Yeah. Well, you you heard it here first, guys, but don't tell anyone else Exuki is running for CSO. Please don't tell anyone else yet. All right, let's, let's move on to some other news. Let's talk about some spaceships that were blowing up, actually. There was a Vendetta that died. It belonged to Test Alliance Please Ignore, or a member of a corporation within Test Alliance Please Ignore. Uh, and it died apparently moving. Do we have any other information on this, or is it just a faction super capital that died because the person was dumb when they were moving? Uh, that's a little bit harsh. Uh, that's, you know, um, that's what I heard. I, I, I don't know for a fact, but, um, you know, I heard that they were just, they just bought it and they were just moving it and just died. Yeah, I mean, I don't know about being the being dumb part. The people in the skill meld, that's what they do, right? And they're exceedingly good at it. So, I, you know, I don't know the exact details behind this, but um, it's unfortunate. They are extremely skilled. In fact, it was brought up, we were discussing this a little bit before the show, and we realized that Avana, uh, yeah, Avana Trading Federation, or whatever they're freaking called, they, um, they were the ones who, when... So, which Keepstar was it that Matterall owned? Who remembers? What system was it in? Malia? Or... No, he was the other one. Oh, yeah, he was... On oh, yeah. He was on Nenin. So, when oh, the Nenin, Nenin yeah. Keepstar got reinforced shortly after the Waffles Keepstar was killed, uh, the Malia Keepstar was unanchored, and there was supposed to be a defense op to defend it and to scoop it, but Ivana Trading came in and stole it. And then they sold it to Test. I think it was Pro God bought it from them and took it down south. Oh, what so we a found out. web we spin. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, we bought both of them. And I know the Malia Keepstar is now in 08, but I don't know where the other one is. Oh, is that what that Keepstar is? Cool. Yeah, that's the Malia Keepstar. All right. Well, in other news of expensive things dying and extremely skilled hunters, another Alliance tournament ship has died. This time it was a Maracha which apparently did not belong to the pilot who was flying it. Reportedly, this particular Alliance tournament ship belonged to a pilot known as Casper24, who then loaned it to the pilot Radicus to fly, and he died. But he died to, uh... How many Alliance tournament ships has Frederick Von Hull killed now? Is this his, like, fifth? I'm gonna check his kill mail, or his kill board. I mean, we should probably try to get him on the show. I mean, he's I tried. To, like dudes like freaking Russian. Extremely or impressive. Like, this is crazy. Yeah. So all he does is, I like to say, he is the hunter of hunters. So people will go out in very expensive blop ships. We see Marshall kill males and two to three billion esque sins, and he will hunt them. And so you can see his keyboard here is just full of the losses of other hunters which I find is extremely fascinating. We talked about him quite a bit when he had, within a single week, he killed a Golden Magnate uh, by Jalop... M- I'm not even going to pronounce his last name. We had him on the show, though. You can go and listen to that. And he killed a Virtuoso within the same week. Like, literally the next day. So that was something we talked about. But extremely skilled hunter. Unfortunate for the pilot who lost the Maraca, because that is a very expensive ship. It's known to be a very good ship. It has bonuses to web range, and it's also just... It's like a rapier on steroids that is also... uh, Yeah, just a rapier on steroids. There you go. But, you know, what's the motivation for that? Like, like why would you chase those really expensive ships that barely are undocked? You know what I mean? You almost think, like... Did he have an AT ship or something that was killed like five years ago? And he's like, you know, Antonio Montagna, you know, and he's he's going to, you know, 
put an end to the AT ship scourge or something like, because that is just crazy to me. Like they never, they're barely undocked, right? They, they just barely, you know, they, they might make an appearance or something every other week and you chase those things down. I don't know. Well, it just seems that's, crazy. That's to me. why you hunt them. Right, like we were talking when Jalop was on the show, it used to be the Titan kills were the apex kills, right? So it's the search for that. What's the next apex? Now Titans die somewhat commonly. So what's the next apex where it dies and you get on the front page of news or we start talking about it? Like we barely talk about Titan kills. Like, yeah, the Vendetta went down. And we're like, yeah, well, that sucks. But the Maracha, holy shit, this thing died. So that's what it's about. He's trying to get to the next apex kill. And not everyone has this opportunity, right? He knows where to find them somehow. He like, he must have some sort of intel on where they live or who's got them, right? That's why I want to talk to him on the show. I want to, I want to know, get inside his mind. How do you know where that Maracha even was? He just happened upon it? Well, like Jalop, he must have been hunting Jalop for a couple of days when Jalop started killing things with it. I'd love to have him on the show in the future. But uh, He's moving on. Come on the show, man. Come on the show. Indeed. In other news, the Stream Fleet Showdown Invitational 2. They sponsored Talking and Stations for a little bit. Unfortunately, had some technical difficulties with the Thunderdome server, which they're going to use to run the tournament. It meant that instead of streaming last weekend on the 20th, they planned on streaming this weekend, the 27th and 28th. And unfortunately, due to further technical issues regarding the Thunderdome server, They've had to cancel the stream altogether. The tournament will still happen. It will be recorded. It just, for various technical reasons, they cannot do it live on stream. And so you can be looking forward to some uh, video content, some recorded video content being produced and coming out in the following weeks. But if you're looking forward to, like I was, watching some EVE PvP tournament-style streams this weekend, unfortunately, you'll have to settle with the Overwatch League or something. I don't know gross yeah i'm disappointed too but i'm glad that they're still making the effort to have the tournament it's important indeed some other in space news we had i actually received some spam mail this week some in-game spam mail from of all things a rental organization i received some spam mail from the period basis rental whatever they are. I don't even know if they have a proper name yet, but they're offering me a new life in period basis, guys. Apparently, it was talked about two weeks ago, I want to say, on the Sunday show, and Carnero said, nope, it hasn't been open for business yet. Well, now it's officially open, and if you want to rent in period basis, apparently you can contact Sados. I just found it funny that somebody stuck a spy in Horde and then sent out a mass mail to everybody. That was <laughs> That's, I love it. Love it. So that's the thing. If you're interested, have fun. Is that uh, is that good space? I, I don't know my null sec. Is that prime real estate? Ooh, that is a very good question. So if we look at the map, it is very in the very south of Eve. It's in the southwest. It is below Delve, which is why Goonswarm Federation, the Alliance, not the Imperium as a whole, but Goonswarm Federation, the Alliance, is running this program. It's just south of Delve. It has no connections to NPC space. If you want to get to NTPC space, you either have to go through Delve or through at least two other NullSec regions. So it's very isolated, which means it could be very safe. Of course, that means nothing as far as what wormholers are concerned, like your C2 raiders, people like that. So the people who hunt from wormhole space out into NullSec, it's just as, easily to ac just as easy to access period basis as it is to access any other NullSec region. So it is theoretically safe from other NullSec powers, not or low sec powers for that matter, but not safe from wormholers. I don't know what the true sec is like in period basis. Is anybody? I'm allergic to local, so I don't think I can live. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what the true sec is. So I have no idea. Uh, you can hit it up there. Yeah, hit true sec up there or no security up. I want to say it's security class. I don't freaking know. I'm not a null sec care bear as much as I try because isk is nice. I just can't do it. In any case, that's a thing. I think we, we've harped out it enough. That's enough free advertising for those guys. Let's talk about some other in-space news, which is something that I noticed but we didn't mention. Uh, fighting has been going on in Pure Blind. 
It's been going on there for a while. You'll recall we've been following the story since Triumvirate basically fail skated. They lost all of their space in the southeast of Eve and up and moved into Pure Blind. And initially they were struggling pretty hard in order to start to clamp some space, set up structures. Snuffed Out was still living in the area, and so they were killing anything they tried to put up. But then Snuff moved down south, and Triumvirate started getting their leadership back in. Their pilots became engaged. Their numbers started to grow. And so they started taking some Sov while we were on break from the show between Season 1 and Season 2. And so now looking at the map, Triumvirate has quite a bit of space, and they actually used to have three more systems down here that now belong to Combat Wombat. If that name sounds familiar to you, it's not just because it is a fantastic name and they have a fantastic logo, but it's also because they used to be, first of all, allied with Just Let It Happen and Lumpy to have the best fan art ever. If you want to enjoy some fan art, go back to when Lumpy, Combat Wombat, and Just Let It Happen were all allied because you had a freaking wombat, a fox, and a squid. And the fan art was glorious, but I'm getting sidetracked. They were allies, they were PvP alliance, that fell apart. Combat Wombat then became Renters and Cobalt Edge, and so we talked about them briefly when the four keep stars were killed, belonging to Machina Empires. Skill Yourself and Hard Knocks killed those. Combat Wombat was intertwined in that story. But now apparently they moved over to Pure Blind and are allied with Triumvirate. You'll see them in what appears to be merged fleets fighting off snuff. So something What's to keep the deal with French faction there. They're back up there, I see. They are back up there. In fact, recently they were fighting to defend a snuffed out Fortazar. They lost a bunch of bombers. So French yeah. Connection are there. They are fighting against Tri. They are fighting against uh, Combat Wombat. That's one of the. It's it's weird to me because Combat Wombat is blue with Pandemic Horde. It is my tinfoil hat that this is purely because they need to move from Cobalt Edge over to Pure Blind, and that move takes them directly through Pandemic Horde space across the map. So it's just it's a matter of convenience. But it also complicates things, because Pandemic Horde and Pandemic Legion are very close, and Pandemic Legion has been working with Tri and Combat Wombat as they're fighting with Snuff. But Tri and Combat Wombat have been actively fighting with Dead Coalition. Most notably, Slice and Darkness, I think, are their two main opponents there. So it's, it's a weird mix of everybody is fighting everybody, but is also friends with everybody. And it's, it, it seems like a situation that could explode or just sort of fizzle out because everybody realizes they can't shoot each other because of conflicting standings. But definitely something that we'll be keeping an eye on and updating you if anything interesting happens. Alright, well that'll do it for this week's episode of Talking in Stations, Season 2, Episode 6. I realize I forgot to mention what day it was at the start of this episode. I hope you weren't very confused. It is currently April, I can't read my own calendar, 25th or 26th, depending on your time zone. So if you forgot what day it is, now you know. <laughs> I'd like to thank our special guest, Exuki Z, for sticking it out with us, even through all that K-Space news that has nothing to do with him. For your trouble, I mean, do you have a shout out for us? Show, so it's fine. Right on. Do you have a shout out for us? Um, well, if people like hearing me talk, I'm talking again in two weeks, so that's always a good shout out. I have a meetup that I'm hosting coming up in, uh, in at the beginning of August for all of my U.S. people that aren't sick of Eve meets after the one in Toronto. Uh, Eve Northeast is happening in New York the first weekend of August, so. Is that I'm limited sure to just wormhole people, or are dirty case spacers welcome as well? Oh, it's I mean it's it's known as a major wormhole meetup because my corp is the one that runs it, but then you know just from networking, some a lot of the first groups to come to it were other wormholers. But um, last year we had over eighty people there, and I'm sure probably more than around half of that was also case based. There was a little PL contingent, um, a spaceship samurai. Uh, there were, I'm sure, I'm pretty confident there were a couple people from Tess. I'm sure there were people from all over uh, that might not have just had a whole click with them, you know, shouting their Alliance logo while they waved their flag around over the campfire. So, you know, there was a bunch of that going on. All right, and that is Eve Northeast, August 1st through the 4th in 
Galway, New York. New York, rather, wherever that happens. All right, how about you, Ron? You got a shout out for it this week? Shout out for us this week. Whew. Um, I guess my shout out would be to all the different shows that we're doing. So we, we do the kind of chill streams in the mornings, like on a couple of days a week. And I'll probably be showing up to those. And we have the new wormhole show. You know, we have this show, we have our Sunday show, and we have a lore show that's in the works and some other things. So, you know, lots of new shows coming out. So good stuff. My shout out goes to shows. my shout out goes to Silver Suspiria's forehead right now. It's fantastic. There's, Look there's, at all those cars. There's somebody in chat that uh, that likes my NASCAR models. Um, so my shout outs to you, brother. I don't know if I could get him close enough, but uh, I'll see. Who cares? Look at that forehead. That thing. Yeah, there we go. Get a nice close up. <laughs> no, wrong point down and to your right. Down and to your right. There we go. Get the sheen on it. Oh, there we go. Fantastic. So, All right. so we should have a modeling show where we give airbrush mm -hmm. lessons and whatnot. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> we're dead sexy, baby. I'm telling you, man, freaking Brisk talked about on Talking in Stations a while ago how he, because of his real life job and everything, he does TV makeup and like he knows how to do his own TV makeup. I really want to get Brisk at some meetup somewhere to do like a tutorial hey, on how to can do he mat down my shine? makeup. We'll get him, maybe you, maybe Matterall. We'll have him put makeup on Matterall's face for something. We'll do a tutorial on how to do Eve makeup for Eve media personalities. It'll be great. Next time Pro God Legend goes on Canadian news, he'll be prepared. Mm -hmm. I don't think I want to do makeup. Sounds like a lot of work. But it sounds fun, though. All right, that'll do it. People can't see my sarcastic smile who are listening to the podcast. I'm not being serious, podcast listeners. I apologize. And they can't In any see case, my shiny head. That's true. They'll just have to go and check it out on YouTube or on Twitch TV forward slash talking and stations. By the way, if you didn't notice, we recently renamed the URL for our YouTube channel. So it is now is youtube.com slash C slash talking and stations. Everything works. It's great. Just search talking and stations and you'll find us. But if you're listening to this podcast, you've already found us, and I thank you very much for listening. That'll do it for this week's episode.